somebody gives you a corpus, it's a large corpus, and this corpus is going to have some words in it. The task of language modeling is that given the past information, you want to predict the next word. And basically, you are trying to model the probability of your corpus or your sentences. What you do, regardless of the model that you choose, let it be an LSTM, let it be a recurrent neural network, let it be a GRU, let it be the decoder part of a transformer. You are always trying to take this past, the context, and encode it in terms of a fixed size hidden state. Okay, let's take a look at transformer, the decoder part of a transformer. And let's say you want to process your text in segments. During the training phase, uh, you give it four words, x1, x2, x3, x4. And here you are predicting x2, x3, x4, and x5. And during training, you know this input, you know the output, you can write down your likelihood coming out of this probability, and you can do your maximization. So you can maximize the parameters. And this is the decoder part of your transformer. Why? Because this point here is paying attention to x1. This point here depends on x2 and x1. This point here depends on x1, x2, x3. So you're always depending on the past. So it's one-sided. This is the decoder part of the transformer, not the encoder. Now you go to the next segment. Somebody gives you a new portion of your text. You take it, you push it through your network, you do your predictions, and you do your training. When you go to evaluation and testing, the task is you want to predict x5, the next word, given the previous words. This is OK for the first iteration, for the first sentence. You are paying attention to x1, x2, x3, and x4 while predicting x5. As you go to the next step, which is predicting x6, x6 is going to depend on x2, x3, x4, and x5. So you're going to forget x1. As you go towards prediction, predicting x7, you are depending on x3, x4, x5, and x6, and you're forgetting the information coming from x1 and x2. So you always have a limited context for transformers. The idea of, the, of this paper is that you want to extend the context, and that's why you have XL, so it's going to be extra long context. So how are we going to do it? Let's write it mathematically. Let's try to do that. Let's uh, set tau to be 1. So you're going to have S1 and S2. It's going to be segment 1, segment 2. Set 1 is going to have x1, x2 up until x4. So L is 4. Segment 2 is going to have x1, x2 up until XL or XL. So you're going to have two segments. We divided our text into two segments, segment 1, segment 2. And these are consecutive segments. They have length L. These uh, H, they are what you see here. Uh, so now we are here. We want to go to the next layer. For H1, this is going to have length L. And each one is going to be a ve vector that is d-dimensional. That's going to give you h1. Then you go to the next layer. That's going to give you h2 up until the last layer. So n is counting the layer, and tau is counting the segment. So you have h1, 1, 1 h1, 2, h1, 3 for segment 1. And you have h2, 1, h2, 2, and h2, 3 for segment 2. Forget about this SG for now. Forget about the stop gradients. What are we going to do? We want these guys to pay attention to these entries as well. So what you're going to do is you're going to concatenate along the sentence length. So you're going to make your sentence two times larger. So it's going to be 2L. And what you're going to do next is for these guys to pay attention not only to themselves, but also to the previous segments. You take these guys h n minus 1 tau plus 1. So you're in segment 2. And let's say n is 2. So this is h 2 1. So we are here. You're going to multiply that by a query matrix. So these are your weight matrices. Otherwise, there is nothing to learn. So you need to introduce weights. And this we already did for the transformer model. We are going to do the same thing. But this is using h, not h tilde. But then for your key and value, we are going to take h tilde. So this is going to have length 2L. Q is going to have length L. Okay, now you're going to do your attention. You multiply query by key. You do a softmax, and then you multiply by V. So it's exactly your transformer layer. 
and then you're gonna do your masking because this is the, the decoder part of the transformer. So you're gonna do transformer layer, the decoder part, you do proper masking, query key value. So query is coming from the sentence, the segment that you're interested in, key and value are gonna include the history. But this is gonna do your training. There is a catch here. The forward pass is fine. It's gonna be super fast. But if you want to do the backward pass, you have to go through these derivatives and then you're gonna have a very huge sequence of derivative operations and that's gonna to be too costly. So you're gonna do an approximation. You stop your gradients here. So in TensorFlow, this is gonna be tf.stopgradient. In PyTorch, you're gonna do dot .detach. So you're gonna detach it so that the derivatives are not gonna go past through the previous segment. And there is nothing special about the previous segment. We can actually have a history. We can have a memory. It doesn't have to have a size of L. It could have a bigger size. So it could have a size of M. You could have a history that is as big as size M rather than size L, okay? So you can have a memory. Visually speaking, what did we just do? This is our new segment. We are paying attention to itself. And then this new segment is also paying attention to the previous segment. So these new connections, they are learnable, the green ones. The gray, the darker gray are also learnable. These connections here, because of the stop gradient, they are not learnable in this round. They are learnable in the previous round, okay? But for this set of data, they are not learnable because you are fixing the gradients. This is this uh, set of, this pair of sentences, pair of segments. Now you go to the next pair of segments. What you're gonna see is the same pattern as before, but now during the forward pass, these uh, light gray connections means that there is some history going on. So you're not forgetting, you're not totally forgetting the past. While computing these guys, there were some information propagating forward. Maybe not backward, but forward, there is some information propagating. Okay, that's during training. For evaluation, now you extended your uh, context. It's not a fixed context of, it's not a limited context anymore. You extended it. Why? Because these guys are paying attention to here. And then this guy is paying attention to here, here, and here. And then you can expand it. This guy is paying attention to here, here, and here. So you can go up until X3, from X3 up until X12. So you extended it the context. So is everything clear so far? The big picture, the idea, any questions? When do we wipe the context? Do we read until the end of a paragraph or the end of a document? Um, so you're that... gonna need, you're gonna read during uh, evaluation as much as you need. So while predicting X13, you're gonna read from X3 up until X12. And it's much better than a context of four. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this depends. The amount of context that you have depends on the choice of M that you have here. Yeah. Okay, the bigger is M, the more context you're gonna have. And then of course, it's gonna become more costly. We know that attention is not costless. Computing this is gonna become more costly. Okay, there is always a trade-off. Any other questions? There's also an added memory cost, right? Because you have to keep the um, the H tildes, which have the um, the hidden states from the previous window. Yes, absolutely. So you're right. But there is a catch. You are this first author and a couple of other authors. Now you're really happy. You manage to extend your context. You're happy. You go sit behind your computer. You code it up. And then your algorithm is not gonna work. And you're gonna have that experience a lot while doing deep learning. An idea looks very promising on a piece of paper, but once you take it to computer, things are not gonna work. So why is this not gonna work? The problem goes back to the details of positional encoding. If you have absolute positional encoding, by absolute, I mean for each of these, x1, for one, two, three, and four, you have their dedicated vectors. So they're, and they're gonna have L max. L max is uh, whatever position that you had here, okay? If you have absolute positional encoding, what's gonna happen? How are you gonna distinguish between x tau and 10 
and x tau plus one and 10. Both of them are gonna have the same vector. They're gonna have the same positional encoding. So you missed the position. So you missed your order. And that's why their framework was not working, okay? When they took it to computer, it wasn't working. So what is the fix? The fix is uh, you cannot store the absolute position for all of your corpus because then it's gonna explode. The corpus size is huge. So you cannot have a matrix that huge. The idea is perhaps all you need is the difference between the indices. So maybe the relative position while paying attention, while paying attention, while X7 is paying attention to X3, maybe just the difference between the indices is what you need. So the relative distance between the two positions is gonna be your positional encoding. Now you can have an L max and this is not gonna explode, okay? But let's go a little bit into more details. At least in the first layer, you have positional encoding in addition to the wording embedding. So you have position embedding and word embedding. For instance, let's say uh, word xj is paying attention to word xi at location i. What would you do? You would write the embedding of xi plus the embedding of the position ui. You multiply it by a weight matrix, and then you do the inner product of that with another one. This is word xi, this is word xj or word xj, word xi, it doesn't matter. Once you expand that term out, this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get E of xi transpose, wq transpose, wk, E of xj. So these are your word embeddings for xi, word xi, and word xj. Then you're gonna have the word embedding for xi and the position embedding for uj. So these are the absolute positions. You're gonna have the position embedding for i, position i, and the word embedding for word at position J. And then you're gonna have another one, which is about positions. Here is the catch. When you are doing relative positional encoding, you're not gonna have these terms. You're not gonna have UJ. It doesn't make any sense anymore. And you're not gonna have UI. So we are gonna need to get rid of them. Let's try to do that. This first thing is fine. This is about word embeddings and we are fine. This is not about positions. So term A is fine. Term B, this term is fine. This is also okay. This term here, we are gonna make it a dedicated matrix for R. And then here, rather than having UJ, you're gonna have the relative position between word I and word J. And this is, you are gonna just read it off from the corresponding row of the relative positional encoding. Let's go to the next one. E of XJ is fine. You're gonna have a dedicated matrix for WK and you're gonna call it WKE. And then you don't have UI anymore. It doesn't make sense. You can merge UI and WQ into a vector, which is learnable. And then you go to the next one, UI doesn't exist. The same way that you merged UI WQ, you're gonna merge UI WQ here and call it V transpose. It's another vector, it's learnable. And then you're gonna have a dedicated uh, matrix here. It's the same matrix as above. And then UJ, you're replacing it by your relative positional encoding. And now you train your method and then it's gonna work. Okay, are there any questions? So this was a very important minor detail that we needed to go through. Yeah. Okay, perfect.